Stephen, wonderful um, to see you somewhere other than the streets of our, of our town. Um, <laughs> Malaprops is such a wonderful store, and I just wish we were there in person, but one of these days. Um, this book, this book can be read in so many different ways, and it had so many different effects on me. Um, one of them is I immediately started pleading guilty, guilty, guilty. I'm a creature of habit and do the exact same thing every day as you caution against. Um, I, I know hair drama, which I would venture to say that a bad color job is is terrible at any age, <laughs> not just for the elderly. Um, and you know, I I I cannot break the habit of two spaces after a period. So um, you you really caught me in so many ways. But but on the more serious scale, uh, this book can it can be read as a memoir because we really get to know you, your, your past um, battle with cancer. We get to know your parents, your siblings. Um, we really come to understand so much about you and your life and the journey you've had. And then it can also be read as this um, kind of how-to advisor, you know, pick your topic uh, where, where you need a little information and get it. Um, there's humor throughout, um, but there's also, you know, you take some very serious turns. And, and, um, and so I love, I love the up and down that you give us but I, I have more to say about that later. But I thought I would just open with asking you to, you know, talk a little bit about how, how this book came to be and maybe read, read a short bit to get us started. Sure, and Jill, let me just say, it's, um, it's a real privilege for me to be in conversation with you and to um, turn it around a little bit because I've had the opportunity to interview you a couple of times during our zoom vacation with <laughs> no it's great and i want to thank everybody at malaprops uh, as well i have been a visitor to the store many times but I, I did not meet patricia or stephanie before so so that is lovely and and to everyone out there who's joining us tonight um thank you um you know it's so funny the title of the book i um i love it and i hate it and I don't know if you've ever had like sort of debates over, over your titles, but uh, this book came about because around the time I was 50 and my parents were in their 70s, I'm a journalist, so I started taking notes on, on them. And it was like, I'm going to do this better than them, and I'm not going to do that. And this list kept growing and growing. And um, you mentioned some of, the, some of the funnier ones, and um, then there's some of the, the, you know, the more poignant ones. And because I often write about my life, it became a New York Times column under the very milk toast headline of things I will do differently when I get old. Um, but it went on the most read list for about two weeks. But what really surprised me was that all these strangers started sending me their lists. And I got about 200 lists from, from various folks, um, including um, several of our friends and neighbors in Hillsboro. So, uh, but I should tell everybody, Jill and I are our friends and we're neighbors. We're about three or four blocks from each other. Normally, I'm, um, I'm in Rock this evening. Um, so I realized there was like a whole generation of us who was in, in one way, you know, observing our elders and our parents. Another, um, I think, trying to make a commitment to ourselves to do things better than we might have been seeing them do it. And so that was the genesis of the book. And then my agent, um, he came up with this, this title, Stupid Things I Won't Do When I Get Old. And um, uh, so it, it, the title has, has resonated. You know, as someone who writes about civility, I always think it's, it's a little bit at uh, contradiction with the rest of who I am. But, um, but I've, I've grown to love it. And um, so I did want to read um, one, part of one chapter. And um, that will be an evocative reading. 
we had a little um, green room conversation, everybody. And um, I was asked, will you be doing an evocative reading? I was like, uh, what is that? And um, so I'm gonna do my best. <laughs> um, so the chapter is, I won't join the organ recital. It can happen anywhere at any gathering, anytime a few people of a certain age get together. First, the fanfare. What's new with you? Then the overture the high cholesterol, the prediabetes, and the bum knee. Before you know it, the music swells and it's a full-blown concert of sciatica, angina, and replacement joints. Welcome to the front row of the worst musical imaginable. You're at an organ recital. Even worse in my experience is the group sing-along. One person mentions a health condition, another chimes in to one-up the first. And rather quickly, you are entwined in an endless tragedy comedy about every ailment from bunions to shingles, cataracts to kidney stones, cancer to heart disease. Boomers like me can't stop talking about ourselves even as we're falling apart. All too many of us are sadly under the delusion that this is appropriate conversation, interesting even. Friends, it is not. Please KK that. And for my friends of a certain age, KK is internet slang for okay, or I've got it. And. Uh, then I go on to um, talk about this date I had several years ago, who actually came to my reading in Quail Ridge. And I was like horrified that he showed up because um, it, during this date, he told me everything about himself, um, repetitive strain, injury, tooth replacement joints, failing eyesight, high, high triglycerides. And you know what really struck me was, I didn't know anything about this fellow other than his medical conditions. And so, um, uh, the point of this chapter is, of course, we have many shared um, ailments and, and conditions these days, but it, it's important not to define ourselves by them and uh, to remember that we're whole people and that we had a past, we have families, we have kids, we have work, we have passions, and to integrate that into you know, who we are and the way we talk about ourselves. And one of, them, one of the things I learned in doing research for this, Jill, is there's this concept that um, researchers have, it's called everyday ageism or casual ageism. And so when we internalize these negative attributes, it actually hurts us. So, if, you know, those birthday cards we might get in, you know, our birthdays are five days apart. We're both July babies, you know, and I, I get them and they sort of like, the print's really tiny and then they make fun of you for not being able to see or remember. <laughs> that hurts our health, that hurts our mental health. And what was really shocking was when we think that it's bad to get older, we live less long, up to seven and a half years. So, so there's a lot of stories in here. You know, there's some other stuff, and I'm hoping that people will think a little bit about the daily decisions that we make. Well, what I also love about it is the is how universal it is, and how every generation says these same things about very different things. And and you know, like I can remember being a kid and. And you know, hearing hearing my parents say of so and so, don't ask how she is because you'll never get off the phone. You know, and I I think it is just the you know, it just keeps rolling through, and each generation comes up with the new list. And um and and yes, we're we're exactly the same age, um and. And so my list would be very similar. Um, you 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 have wonderful quotes throughout. Some I love I loved the piece about um, scars mm. and that great Cormac McCarthy quote um, that you inserted about scars have the strange power to remind us that our past was real and. Um, that's just such a wonderful way to say it. I, I've often used scars in writing class as a prompt, you know, to because there's always a good story there. Um, but in fact, this idea of of it being, you know, like a tattoo, mm -hmm. a, a kind of memorial to um, this other part of your life, is is a great way to view it. Well, thank you for for saying that. That was, um, some of this book was actually hard for me to write because at first I started off, 
you know, I had my list and I was like exposing my parents, but it became really clear to me that if this was going to be a book that was engaging, I needed to put myself into the mix and I needed to make myself vulnerable too, which I, th I think I have. And um, the, that chapter about scars um, really talks about how when I was a young man, 26, I had um, various cancer surgeries and I have, um, I have three scars from that alone, including a 12 inch scar here. And it was very hard for me to be um, naked with myself, much less other people. And I remember the great lengths that I would go to, you know, in, in meeting somebody, I'd be wearing a shirt, I would play with the lights. And, but over time, um, kind of this self-acceptance, this acceptance of the experiences that I had been through, you know, the resilience that I saw, um, you know, it, it spoke to me as, as a healing aspect and, um, you know, and to, you know, I know to many others and to many of my friends, so I'm kind of this human guinea pig in this book as well. Um, and trying to show either through my experience or my family's or through humor, how we can talk about some of these topics, how we can um, process them and move forward. Well, there is so much about acceptance, you know, um, and I think we can take what you write about that scar and apply it to sort of many ways that someone might might view their bodies and and this whole idea of, you know, coming to terms acceptance and, and in the same way, accepting um, age and what comes with it, you know, um, a whole, a whole lot of wisdom. I mean, the package might be a little rough around the edges, <laughs> but but what's inside is is a lot richer um, in well, in many ways. So you know, a, a lot of the themes, though though you're you're going from a different angle, you know, there is this this repeated um, sort of rising to the top of it all. I mean, you clearly are a glass half full person. And um, I'm curious, have you always been or, or was this a transformation in life? I, um, I most definitely was not. And um, I think that, you know, when I, when I was younger, I, um, I was not only a pessimist, I was kind of a, I was a know-it-all and um, I kind of, I got through college and I was in graduate school and everything just was easy for me. And, and then having, um, having cancer was not easy. And that, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not like a make a lemonade out of the, the lemon kind of guy, although maybe I have become that. Um, but I saw so many ways that, that I grew and that I learned to appreciate people and relationships and aspects that, um, that I, I really hadn't before. And, you know, we talk, um, you know, on and off about sort of the politics of these times and, you know, how challenging that is and the polarization. I do have, um, you know, sort of a fundamental belief that all of us are, are good at heart. And um, one of the surprising things I learned about the book after I was finished with it, and it was really when I started talking about it, was that in the book, I'm, I'm sort of urging people to be open with each other, to be vulnerable as a way to connect, and that we all have these frailties, and that's how we can see each other and, um, and appreciate each other and love each other. And it, it was said to me as I've been talking about the book that in the sort of the larger world that we live where we, we're red and we're blue and we're vaxxed and we're not, if we can find ways to be open and vulnerable and listen, I think we can make strides in bridging some of some of those gaps. And um, I was curious to have that learning like after a book is done and it's almost like from readers coming coming to me and, and talking to me about it. Yeah, well, I'm, I mean, and I think, I think just the whole idea of being civil, you know, in, in the back and forth and, you know, attempting to have a conversation in, instead of to shame and blame um, makes such a difference. So, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and there's a lot of forgiveness in the topics here. I mean, I, I was struck, um, you know, you write a lot about your mother and she 
clearly uh, was just this um, amazing, amazing open woman, um, you know, and, and sometimes you, we see her as kind of a, a Cosmo girl, you know, just, um, and yet also um, maternal in, mm -hmm. in all, all the best ways and, and the very proper manners that then deteriorate in, in the face of dementia. Mm -hmm. And, and um, of course, that one was very meaningful to me, you know, to, to watch this change in personality. I mean, um, I think so many of us dealing with aging parents are, you know, the roles are reversed in ways that shock us. And, and then we ease into this place of comfort where you know, we're, we're somehow able to see both the person who was and the person who's there now. And um, I think you talk about that um, really beautifully in several pieces throughout. So you clearly were very close to your mother. Um, I was, although my mother, you know, everything, in, well, not, not everything in the book is true because my brother and sister, you know, they're, well, you're misremembering that one. And I say, well, that's my remembrance. That's, <laughs> my, that's my truth. And you weren't there then necessarily. Um, you know, and I know you've written beautifully and evocatively about your mother. I think um, it was in Mothers and Strangers that you had that essay about, about your mother, which I loved. And I encourage everybody to, to get that book. There are many great writers um, in it. Um, I, I was also transformed by my mother's um, diagnosis of, of dementia because I remember before she, before she knew and before I knew, I was standing next to her and the phone rang for me and I could hear the person on, on the line saying, may I speak to Stephen? And my mother had this blank look on her face and she said, he's not here. And I was like, mom, I'm right here. You know, what are you doing? And I was, I was angry with her because I didn't understand. And um, you know, I had no clue. Um, and over time, I began to recognize, you know, the various ways that this disease can really take over someone's personality. And, um, and then I also learned through a Jack Russell Terrier that I, that I had, I've, I've learned a lot from, from my dogs over the years who developed dementia and, um, and how much she needed me to help her navigate the world. And so that really um, helped me come back and, and work with my mom with a much different perspective and to stop arguing with her over, no, it's not Wednesday, it's Thursday, like, like that oh. mattered. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. But I don't you think a lot of times, I mean, we, when we argue it is as much is as much for ourselves, you know, trying because we don't want to see what's happening, you know, and I think anyone who has dealt with dementia, you, um, that is kind of part of the denial. I mean, what's sad is when people don't, don't leave the denial um stage and persistently try to get the person back because it's it's right. just not going to happen that way um yeah that's you that's, know that's true and it's and um and you do manage to you know inject humor at the right points and and you remind us that you know scientifically laughter will make mm -hmm. us younger <laughs> no. which is always good to hear it is, and, and laughter will, um, it's not going to cure us of maladies, but it will help us feel better and, um, you know, and have fewer symptoms. And so, um, you know, I, I know we both laugh a lot, um, and, uh, and I encourage people, you know, it, there's a hormonal release with it, too. So, you know, there, there, there are many benefits of... Um, I remember years ago when I, when I read that whole article and, you know, the study... In, in the New York Times, I remember actually calling Lee Smith mm -hmm. um, and saying, who, who knew we'd been working out so hard all these years? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, um, you know, that reminds me, there's, um, there's a chapter towards the end in, in a section that's called The End. And um, my parents 
wanted and didn't want burial plots. And we came from a little bit of a quirky family where we had a great aunt who tried to give my family a dozen plots decades before and they had been turned back. And, um, <laughs> So, so now we're at, we're at the cemetery in Sag Harbor, New York. And my mother had like, yes, we'll go. No, I have a hair appointment. I can't go. Yes, we'll go. I have this. And so we're out there and we're in the, it's the winter. And um, my dad's like, he just wanders off because that was one of the things he did. And then he comes back and he goes, okay, this place will work for me because um, now I'm forgetting um the name of the um, of the editor of um, New York Magazine, who is um, buried right right next door, married to Gail Sheehy, and Clay Felker, who went to Duke. And uh -huh. This is this is a good neighborhood. I'm in. And then, <laughs> then my mom said, "Well, if I can have a vodka gimlet, I will say yes too." And um, so we had our buy-in, and you know, I kind of tell the story, which is it's a hard story about um, you know one's final. Um, home and, and so on by by bringing the humor in and um, and all of us were laughing at that point yeah. and then when we did bury them several years later we, were, we you know we remembered those stories and that we had stood on that ground and we had all laughed and that was um that was one that was one of the beautiful memories we carried you know, along with along with the loss yes yeah no that's a, a wonderful part um um, I, I also was really struck. I mean, you were talking earlier about the the need for for those bridges, and um, and I I just feel it's a really generous a generous gift um, you have given the the bridge you have found um, with the relationship with your own father. I mean, I, I think for me, one of the, um, and I know I, I don't want you not to read another passage because I, I love what you have up ahead. Mm -hmm. um, but along with that, the other place in the book that I just found so emotionally moving is um, you, your discovery of these little fragments, you know, of your father's writings and, and the one in particular that you feel really addressed you. Mm -hmm. And um, just the way that you have come to terms with um, the differences, you know, that had been there and, and now it exists in a way that is just so generous and accepting. Uh, speaking of crossing those bridges and I um, I wonder if you would just talk a little bit about that because to me that is the best example of all in this book of, of doing just what you described. I, I want to pay you a compliment Jill because I've done a lot of interviews now and uh, this is a question I've not been asked and, and most of the questions uh, you know are, are unique to you and I love that and you know when you're talking about fragments you know, that immediately makes me think of your book hieroglyphics and the fragments and for those of you who are watching there are many of those hieroglyphics on, on Jill's um, bookcase behind her. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah and my so my dad was a journalist also and he in his sort of last 10 years he wrote he wrote a book called Very Short Fictions which was not fictions at all. Um, they were sort of thinly disguised um, short stories and I think the one you're alluding to, um, the very short one, he talks about his gay son, who is me, and how they really always had a cordial relationship, but not a close relationship. Um, and, and at another point, he talks about how his, his two sons began to tell him what to do, and he was very resentful of that. Um, there was an honesty in, in, in how he wrote um, that was that was painful to to read, um, although true. And uh, but by making it part of the conversation, it did allow us to talk about some of these some of these themes themes. And I don't want anyone to think that we had a perfect relationship because we did not have a perfect relationship. There was, I think, on both ends, still a lot of um, hurt. But um, in those last years, there was opportunity to come closer. 
And, um, and we both made that effort. And I think you know, one of the things I've, I'm learning in my 60s is that when you have an intention, you have to act on that intention to make it valuable. Right. And, um, because intentions are like, like dreams, they'll just sort of fly away if you don't tend to them. Absolutely. And I, I, I think that is the perfect uh, lead in to this other reading you have in mind if you want to talk a little because because I think we all imagine um, you know we, we write all those letters in our heads um, and sometimes they actually make it into print and sometimes they don't or you make the phone call you send the card mm -hmm. um, those intentions and uh, that you know they become more and more valuable as we go forward they do, and um, you know, and so we're going to talk about a couple of, of a couple of letters here. And you know, in a way, it seems like letters are so old-fashioned, and that you know, nobody nobody wants to do them anymore. But I, I hope that people who are listening will see um, the value of of, of letters, re see that value. And um, the chapter is titled, I Won't Die Without Writing Letters to My Loved Ones. And um, I'll set it up a little bit. So um, this chapter is mostly about my friend, Jacqueline Zinn. And she and I went to, to Duke together. And then we became friends again in the um, early 2000s. And she, she lived in Chapel Hill with her husband, Doug, and four children. And um, about the time she was 55, she was diagnosed with brain cancer, which is one of the most challenging uh, types of cancers. And uh, she did everything. I mean, I remember she had scars in her skull, she'd gone through chemo. She did not let anything get by her. Um, but as it got towards the end, and she realized she was getting towards the end, she decided to sit down and write letters to her four children to be opened at various points in, in their lives. And Jerry Zinn, who is um, the second born, uh, was very kind to share two of his letters with me that he had received, one, um, one upon her death and one upon graduating from college. And um, I think he gets the next one when he gets married and I've cautioned him not to get married, just to get the one, <laughs> <laughs> to make a one. Good, good advice there. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's silver haired me. Um, and so, um, so what he told me was, the letters my mother left me are among the most precious gifts I possess. She diligently took the time, the very limited time, as her life was coming to an end to sit down and think about her children's futures. And um, so I've seen these letters, they, um, they're on a legal pad, a white legal pad with um, a blue, a blue rule, and and Jackie wrote with a blue pen. And Jill, I've never seen your handwriting, um, and mine, mine would put me to shame. But Jackie had sort of this classic perfect penmanship that we learned when we went to school, and you know the Fs were just you know had the flourish and the G, and the, it really that would not me. be me. That would not be you. <laughs> <laughs> well, Jackie, Jackie had maintained that art form. And Amazing. So, so I want people just to think about how these letters looked uh, as, as, as I read part of, part of this one. Dear Jerry, my budding filmmaker, I know you have a lot of emotions running through you as I did when my father died, but I was much older than you at the time. So I really can't begin to truly comprehend what you were feeling. I am so incredibly sorry that I had to die while you were so young, and I assume it sucks for you. Perhaps you can use some of these emotions and feelings in your upcoming works, assuming you continue to pursue film. Let me assure you that I did absolutely everything I could to stay alive for as long as possible. I know you realize that having been with me at many of my treatments or tests, plus the acupuncture, tons of praying I also did. But for some reason, I just didn't make it as one of the chosen ones to be cured. But because of what I did, I'm sure I lived much longer than if I hadn't been in good shape to begin with. I'm incredibly proud of you for everything you have done in your relatively short life. 
I will be watching over you every day to see what new and exciting things you accomplish, regardless of what you do. Do your best to support dad and your siblings, especially during this first year, as it will be the hardest for everyone. I remember that from when my dad died. Time will certainly help, but it takes a long time to focus on the happy memories while the sad thoughts are more immediate and closer at hand. And then she ends it. I love you more than you will ever know, my dearest Jerry. Love mom. And the L is that beautiful L and the M is the, um, you know, sort of the highly scripted MOM. And, what um, an amazing, amazing woman. And, was. and I think it took so much, that. it's such a gift. And I know, I know her kids have seen it as a gift that, you know, these notes from the past can arrive in the present. And, um, and they bear so much of the personality and, and character of Jackie. I think that's why, I mean, that's why the written word is so powerful. I mean, even just hearing you, you know, read the letter, um, to read a letter conjures the person. It's so present, you know, you can't help but visualize a, an individual with pen and paper mm -hmm. at the time. You know, it's just so immediate and present in that way. It, it's just beautiful. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm honored that the family um, you know, let, let us publish them and, and um, uh, they've been very happy in the ways that Jackie has also been remembered through this process. So. Well, and it, it certainly, I mean, it's the best example uh, we, the readers, could get, you know, to, to make good on those things you want to say others or you know, you know what goes, you want to leave it goes back to intention and, yes and you know and i know that as she was writing them she was partly paralyzed and um you know so it was an effort it was an effort aside from the emotional effort and um so um and i try to i try to extract some of some of what i've learned from all you know all these people in my life to you know you know to do a little better to um not react in the moment, which can often be a moment of anger or so on. And to think, is this necessary that I say it or is there a better way that I might try to say it? Right. right. No, it, it is, um, I mean, it, it is a section that really just sort of leaves you needing to put the book down and then come back. And, and then, of course, we come to the passage I had mentioned earlier about mm -hmm. your father. And, mm -hmm. and so it is this, um, this journey to, to that, a, a real sense of resolution, um, a personal resolution, you know, with your story. And it, it, it really does feel that way. But it, but it also brings the reader, you know, from, from these sort of universal, what we were saying, generational, I'm not going to do that. I, I'll stop driving before I knock over the fire hydrant or whatever. Um, but but it, it really locates it in the most um, human place, you know, um, the griefs that we experience in life sort of eclipsing eclipsing all else yep. and and how to how to deal with grief and also hold on to all of the joy uh, that brings the kind of laughter you know that you're talking about and i i um I, I wondered in putting it together, you know, you um the it's it's with Roseanne Foley Henry. Could you could you briefly tell a little bit about that relationship? And I was I, very interested in um, you know, just from the editorial standpoint yeah. of how that came to be. I hope Roseanne is is listening. I don't know that she she is, but Roseanne and I have been friends and, and colleagues for probably 20 years at this point. And um, I had worked for a publishing company and she was she was my number two. And um, you may not even know this about me, Jill. I am, first of all, I am a very disorganized person. I would never guess that. 
I, I am. And Roseanne is as buttoned up as they come. And so when I initially hired her, I was hiring to all of my deficits. And she's like, uh, she's, she's, she's organized, she's smart. And so she, she initially she helped um, me shape the book and also set deadlines and, and meet them. And she, you know, she said that she created this like Excel spreadsheet calendar. You have to finish five chapters this month and then so on and so forth. And, um, and, uh, and she also brought um, a good deal of, of her own humor to, um, to some of my writings. She's, she's a very fine editor. So uh, it was- it That was is really such an interesting discovery, Stephen. I mean, I have seen your beautiful home. I have seen your perfect Christmas tree. How can this be? How can this be? <laughs> um, and maybe it's, you know, maybe it's also how I see myself. Um, uh, but I struggle with deadlines and, and, and I feel like chaos moves around me, which I get, which I, I, I understand it's not apparent, but that's how I, you know, that's how I perceive my. Well, it's just interesting to me, you know, from the standpoint of how a book is put together, because, you know, the same like with the story collection, it can be just the collection of all the pieces, you know, which which someone might do with a lot of um, columns or essays that have come. But but then there are those that are shaped into, you know, the whole so that the the structure has its own journey above and beyond the little individual journeys within. And, and this has successfully done that. I'm showing the book here. Um, just the, the order of the parts and, and the way that you really do move us into the kind of most serious place of all um, to leave us. So I don't know, I don't know your writing process, but when it, with this book or when I'm writing a column, I feel like there's a, I'm, I'm creating a jigsaw puzzle and that the first step is to identify all the pieces without knowing though what you're making or what I'm making. And then, then it's to shape it into, you know, a picture, a story, a narrative. And that was, that was a challenge. That was the, that was the most challenging part of this. Because but it's also the most exciting, I think. Absolutely. Because eventually, if you're lucky, it happens. Yeah. Um, but I spent many, many weeks in what, what my friends call the middle model, when you're <laughs> just kind of lost and going around and you think, am I ever going to find my way? Or maybe, you know, does that ever happen to you? Years, no. <laughs> years of will I ever find my way? Years of works and a million pieces that look like they don't go together. Yeah. So, well, I, I take comfort in knowing that because it's um, but, just because we also have gotten to our various um, endpoints at, with the different books, which is right. Right. And, and both dealing with these kinds of bits and pieces of life happening around us. I mean, as your neighbor now, it was very interesting to recognize several other neighbors, including my husband, you know, there it is. Yes. <laughs> Tom, Tom, Tom is in there. Getting coffee and, and you're just, you know, you're such, you're observing and and um, taking it in and, and these everyday moments, um, whether it's yoga with Amy. Um, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I love that, that not wanting to reverse the order of the legs. I have that problem too. But it, anyway, a good lesson in here about shaking up our, our habits. Yes. Um, but yeah. I recognized many people along the way. But what was interesting is that you know, change the names. We we all know those encounters in our daily lives and those conversations. And you have taken them and sort of pasted them onto this bigger screen. Well, thank you. And I, I think what that illustrates is, you know, we all have these kinds of happenstances in our lives where we we're with others, we we can learn from each other. 
you have to be paying attention a little bit. Definitely. And it reminds me that I'm going to try to have a good hair day and not wear some of those clothes that are too young for me if I think I might see you. <laughs> you and I mostly see each other when we're walking. And <laughs> this summer we've been kind of sweaty and it's... <laughs> But somehow her daughter always looks fantastic when she's with you. Yeah, she, I know. That's why I take her. That's why she goes with me. She looks great. And I just. Work. <laughs> well, I'm going to jump in now, if I may. Hi. Hi there. I wanted to uh, congratulate you both on a wonderful conversation. Uh, intimate yet universal. I yes, think that, I think that's that a great way to say it, I think. See how it is. So a few questions, and I wanted to start. Stephen, you touched on this a bit, and it's a process question. Mm -hmm. So many people want to know, how do you do it? And I know you said it's sort of a like a, a jigsaw puzzle, but do you write every day? Are you a fan of the prompt? What? How do you approach writing and keep yourself going? I have, I call it a writing practice, which is my job, but I, I treat it as almost as a yoga practice, which is I've made a commitment to write and I write for at least four hours a day. Let's put it this way. I am at my desk in front of my laptop for at least four hours a day. And, um, but I, I make that commitment and, uh, and, you know, Monday through Friday, and I'm, I'm sort of, I keep banker's hours in that way. I, I start close to nine, I'll break for lunch and then I'll do editing and other, other things in the afternoon. But um, that, um, that kind of um, structure really helps me, especially in light of my acknowledgement that I'm completely, you know, in chaos. So when you uh, you so you write for part and then you edit the other part is are they they're the same day? I won't I won't be editing what I've what I've written. I'll I'll be working on simultaneous projects, or I'll you know I'll be working on a column for the Washington Post, and I'll be doing some interviewing um, for that or some research. But I use different parts of my brain in in different parts of the day. But I'm freshest in the morning. So when you are. The, how do you gain inspiration when you're doing so many different projects? Are, are you one of those people that everyone is sort of on the lookout? Here comes Steven. Watch out. It's going to wind <laughs> up. It's going to wind up in, in a book or everybody uh, say please and thank you and use may instead of can. Or are they just like, whatever, let it all hang out. Well, Jill, Jill has wound up in something I wrote as well. <laughs> um, and uh in a very nice moment when I was when I was in a very bad place, I was walking and, and Jill just stopped and gave me a hug and a laugh and a smile. And that did um, turn up in a piece I wrote about gratitude. Yeah, I think people sometimes worry about me and I will often say I am off duty now. And when I say I'm off duty, I am off duty. Um, <laughs> but I never, I never publish anything without um, asking for permission. So it's not like I'm... Um, or you have to have passed. <laughs> I, I love that because it's sort of like being the journalist who who abides by that. Now this is uh, background. This is mm -hmm. off the record, and so there's a level of trust that people develop because they know there's no surprise when they end up uh, in a in something. They're like, oh. I, I think secretly many of them are hoping to be in in a piece, <laughs> and my mother. Who um, it's some of these call some of these chapters appeared as columns in a different form in the New York Times. She loved that, um, even that part of that story about buying funeral plots. She just laughed and laughed, and um, uh, so it was, it was sweet. But I did I did have her um, okay on it too. Well, I thought there's no way you're going to be able to regift those plots. And so I was like, hmm, let's see. I, I want to see how this story goes. Or maybe you did. I don't know. I think it was really a good story. So um, you, the title uh, of your book, you said it was your agent and that you've grown to love it. Mm -hmm. Did you have an idea? And a lot of times authors have said, 
I had a title and, and it didn't work out or I had a title and it got shot down. Did you have a title or what, how did you, how do you negotiate those things? You know, I was, um, uh, you know, I was quite happy with the very milk toast title, things I will do differently when I get old that had come from, from, from the times. Um, but my agent and then my editor wanted something with, with more sass in it that would be um, sort of gripping to people or, or provoke, it was, it's provocative. And, um, and it was so provocative that even though I'm a contributor to AARP and its various publications, they made a corporate decision that the title was off brand for them and they would not um, in any way mention this book. And um, that was a disappointment to me. But, what a shame. Uh, yeah. They were very, in the end, they were very upfront um, about it because uh, I was coming at them in various ways and they were like, we, we need to tell you what we really think. You know, it was the word stupid, probably. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think they, you know, they hadn't read the book and I guess um, they didn't really understand stupid can mean love. Right. Yeah. Tongue in cheek can be, you know, there's, there's those things. Well, well, when I was uh, reviewing your book, you know, and thinking about uh, in your website, it seems to me like you are trying to make people's lives better. And, I, and my cat has just showed up who's speaking of <laughs> Pearl is trying to make my life better. So my cat is nearby, but, uh, it seems to me like part of the role of a columnist and part of the role in this book that you've taken on as well as, you know, learning from other people's mistakes. Here's what, here's what we can do better. We can be more thoughtful, reflective. How did you come to this role, this position of thinking about civility, thinking about how we can be better because that's not, that doesn't see, um, what's in your background that brought you here or was it just a surprise? You know, one, one small part of the answer would be my mother was, she gave me crane stationery that matched hers when I was a young person and taught me to write thank you letters. But I actually don't think that is what we're talking about when we're talking about civility. Um, yes, it's, it's, it's a good thing to be thankful and to express gratitude, but we, we kind of get, I think, sidetracked by what's polite and what's um, sort of what's proper decorum. I, um, I, I honestly don't really know how I wound up in this place. I had been doing an advice column and it was really a relationship advice column for, for many, many years, you know, and then trying to solve individual problems. And when I was at the Washington Post, it, it was called Civilities before I realized it was sort of about the larger themes. And that I kind of shifted because I'd also said all I had to say about um, many relationships and started to talk about larger issues and especially language. Language has really come to um, fascinate me as you know, how important that is in terms of, of the values that we convey. And um, I'm just finishing a piece now about um, the language that's associated with mental health conditions. And, um, you know, and we use words that denigrate individuals unthinkingly. And um, so in a sense, trying to just help us again, focus on how people might be responding to what we hear and what's in the culture and, and movies and so on. Um, you and Jill, not only are you neighbors, you're in the neighborhood. You're you're very Mister Rogers like in that way. I think there's something very there's something very wholesome about this conversation that that I <laughs> I wouldn't call it edgy. I would say it's very uh, warm. It's a very warm uh, conversation and relationship. So if you're th if you're thinking about uh, people who are strangers. And they're in those moments where they're, they're like they're talking about getting old, or, or they're or you hear the uh oh aches and pains. Here we go. Mm -hmm. How do you guide? How do you guide 
the, the, the person you don't know out of the treacherous uh, waters of, oh my, my, my elbow, my gout. Well, I do, even aside from the aging topics, um, you know, if somebody says something that's mean or, you know, is acting out, you know, I, I, I do have a methodology, which is, you know, I'm not gonna call them out in public. I'm not gonna like condemn them on Facebook. Um, but when I think I can make a difference, I will take them aside and, and have a conversation and also try to listen to them um, and rather than coming in with sort of this, this sort of presumptive um, point of view. And um, because nobody, nobody changes, nobody responds when, when you, know, you, you wag their finger, your finger at them or you shame them, um, which isn't to say that I don't sometimes have that impulse because I'm not nearly as wholesome as um, I might appear. <laughs> well, I, uh, I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad, I'm glad you've got some edges and uh, that, uh, and you said you're not very organized, which even shocked Jill. So it was like, okay. <laughs> yeah, that was the big, that, that was the big discovery is, it's like, you know, watching that new Bob Ross doc. And, and, then, and my uh, big discovery was that that wasn't his normal hair. It was, a, it was a permanent. I, know, I was just watching that this week. <laughs> Right, that was the, that was my my biggest takeaway was wow those were perms. That's his signature, you know, sort of like <laughs> part of his signature. Other than you know, fluffy clouds make them happy, things like that. that, that so like, now, wow. yeah. So now I'm going to picture Stephen with this little tornado behind him, you know, this fleeing. Well, you're both so uh, disciplined and prolific, at least on the surface, which is, which is the, the grand illusion, right, of the successful authors. But uh, I'd like to ask you both, uh, as we're getting close to the top of the hour, Stephen, oh, what's next for you? And then uh, Jill, what, what's next for you too? Oh. Well, so I talked earlier about this jigsaw puzzle so I don't know what the picture is and I don't know what all the pieces are, but the, um, the general theme is trying to understand better how being civil can and has been at times um, counterproductive to social change. And uh, some of the research I've done, the suffragettes who were outside the White House in, in the 19 teens and early 1920s protesting, they were, continually called out for being being uncivil, unpolite, and yet we would not have that kind of change. And the same thing for the civil rights movement. So I'm trying to sort of play around with, with those themes and, um, and find something that's useful to say out of that. And are you in your sort of putting your ideas down phase or where, when might, might we expect this? I'm not exactly sure. I'm not gonna make a commitment to that yet. Okay. Um, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm working on an outline. Wonderful. And then, Thank then you. I'm looking forward to that. I think we need it. I am looking forward to that one as well. That Jill, what about fun. you? I am working on short stories. I, I, used, I turned back to stories in between novels. And um, so that's where I am. And do you have some ideas or, or where, where are you in your process? Oh, I'm in a very messy, messy with about, you know, with about four finished stories and about um, seven that look horrible, you know, just bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. But well, that sounds like that sounds like you're both right where you need to be. That sounds <laughs> like what the authors need right now is to be in the in the midst of brainstorming outlining writing revising looking at the bits and I think as a writer it's the most I, I think the best place is when you're kind of in that messy place just about to see how it all right comes to light the discovery yeah or the pre-discovery yeah well, I love that so much. I think it's very inspiring to to hear 
authors because sometimes we may think of it as like Athena springing fully grown out of Zeus's head, you know, and then you go, hmm, man, I don't think it works like that. And so <laughs> so uh, it's, it's always reassuring, but it, it's, it's the work, it's work sort of like you were saying, Stephen earlier that, you know, you've made a commitment, you put, you put in the time and the business hour sort of approach working hours and Jill, you as well, you know, talking about something's finished, not finished the pieces. And I, uh, I really appreciate both of you during this conversation, first of all, for your candor, because thinking about difficult subjects, even painful subjects, uh, it, it's nice to have it wrapped in friendship, love, understanding, compassion. And I think uh, in, in your own ways, you not only show that in your friendship and your, your collegiality as well as authors, but you brought it to this event tonight and to this great subject that you're tackling, Stephen. And I think it, once again, you're helping us and, uh, and it doesn't seem wag of the finger at all. Oh, very well said, Patricia. You used the word warm. And I think I, that d really does describe um, Stephen's book. And it, you know, it, it makes you want to get on the high road, you know. <laughs> right. okay. So, But there's still a lot of humor that points lots of d other directions. So the edge is there, Patricia. It's... Um, well, thank the you. The road not taken, maybe, but. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you both. And, and Jill, especially thank you. Um, you know, it's, it's to talk to, to you, someone who I, um, you know, who knows me, except for my one secret about chaos. <laughs> um, you know, it, um, it made me, it just makes me very comfortable to have had this, this conversation with you. And, um, and so, and so thank you for that. Well, a pleasure for me. It's now pouring rain here in Hillsboro. It's but... pouring here and blowing rock too. So, <laughs> we have some sunlight. We, we've got a little sunlight here at the end, but hey, that's the virtual world for you, right? Is that exactly. we're coming to you from all sorts of places. I, I want to thank you so much, Stephen, for joining us this evening and being in a wonderful and warm conversation with Jill McCorkle. Stephen's book is Stupid Things I Won't Do When I Get Old. Stephen, congratulations. We uh, hope the audience will always think of uh, purchasing books from your local independent bookstore. And uh, remember that you can view this uh, again. If, there, uh, if you missed any part of it, you can use the link you received to go back into YouTube and watch it again. Congratulations, Stephen. Thank you again, Jill. And I hope you all have a wonderful evening. We look forward to what you're writing next. Well, thank, thank you. you. We thank look you. forward. And I hope people will buy our books tonight through Malacross. <laughs> so we're, we're very happy to, to be supporting you. So thank you. And we look forward to being back there in person too. Yes. Please That's come and see. Support. I'll Please see you in the book soon, Jill. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.